The minor port stock has been the topic of many conversations as of late, and in today's video, we're going to look at its price actions, the recent developments, the technicals, and my opinion on if you should be buying the stock. As the market is still very volatile at the moment, we should be mindful of which positions to pick, as well as their individual timing and exposures. Before today's video begins, if you would like to see more stock analysis videos like this one, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Matterport initially had a few weeks which let us believe that it's going to recover some of its losses, and in the end, it seems like the downward pressure has now resumed, which probably influenced by the market as a whole. Matterport requires somewhat of a higher risk tolerance than the typical blue chip stocks for potential stakeholders to be interested, because the company has not been profitable yet, and the current reality is that investors may have less patience now than what they have one or two years ago. In the long run, the stock certainly seems to have an affordable position and real value, but the real question is if the current sell-off may be reversed. At the end of the day, there is no absolutes in terms of whether the stock is high or low, but simply a question of whether the market is currently looking at it in favorable terms or not. Judging by the instabilities around the world, rising inflation and the debacles of cryptocurrencies, I think that the market is favoring solid and safer options on the whole. It doesn't really mean that Matterport doesn't have value. A quick look at its products will tell you that the company has real potentials to provide useful services to end users as the technology matures and gets higher adoption. It's also useful to remember that the market doesn't always reflect the fundamentals of a company, but the mood of those who buy and sell the pieces of that company. Now, let's take a look at the technicals of Matterport. The trading volume of Matterport has recently been 4.8 million shares, compared to the average volume of 6.3 million shares. Over the previous 52-week period, its price fluctuated between $3.62 and $37.60. The trading volume is a metric that can tell you how many shares are being exchanging hands and whether there's a lot of activities and attention on the stock. It often gives you a first idea about the popularity of the stock, and when we use it to compare with the average volume, it can also tell us if the company is enjoying additional momentum to reverse its trend or to break through the current resistance levels. Even when the current volume is lower than the average, it is an interesting indication because this may signify that a trend reversal may be happening. The market cap of Matterport is currently at $1.1 billion dollars, versus an enterprise value of $2.1 billion. To put simply, the market cap is the fair market value of the company based on the current market sentiment, the company's reputation, and other macroeconomic factors, whereas the enterprise value is usually the cost that the company has already paid for its assets after paying off the debts. It's worth mentioning that one of the most significant assets for many growth companies may be the intangibles, meaning they're not items, inventory, or equipments but promises that this company can grow significantly in the future. They're more like pledges for major contracts, existence of competent managers, and schematics for new products. What all that means in concrete terms is that there can be a huge difference between the market cap and the enterprise value, giving a false impression to the market participants that the company is trading at a discount. It's only trading below its book value, but doesn't mean that the company itself is necessarily undervalued. It's also possible that the company itself was overvalued to begin with, and it has only deflated back to where it's supposed to be. As we compare the current price to the historical price fluctuations, the stock is 7% higher than the one-month low, 7% higher than the 12-week low, and 7% higher than the 52-week low. On the options market, which often gives a hint on the market sentiment on where the stock price is likely going to head next, the implied volatility is 97% versus a historical volatility of 108%. The put call volume ratio is currently at 2.5. It is normal for many stocks to also tend to have a higher put option volume than what they truly deserve, as many institutional investors hedge their long positions by buying put options. The most recent volume of options traded has been 1.3 thousand contracts a day versus the 30 day average of 3.3 thousands. In terms of open interest, the most recent volume of open interest has been 213,000 contracts 
versus a 30-day average of 210,000 contracts. The option contract is a derivative from the underlying security, giving participants the possibility to have the right to either buy or sell the security at a predetermined strike price. Buying the contract gives you the right. Selling the contract gives you the premiums with an obligation to execute those rights if the counterparty chooses to exercise them. It is often said that you can evaluate the likelihood of a scenario based on the opposite of what the current ratio is. If there's a lot of put options, then there may be possible uptrends on the move. Or that the reversal may happen if there's a lot of call options. The reasoning behind that theory is quite simple. Most contracts would expire worthless. In terms of its shareholder structure, institutional shareholders own about 8% of the outstanding shares. The biggest shareholders include Vanguard, Fidelity, and iShares. It's relevant to understand the shareholder composition of a company because this can help us to determine whether you should hold the stock long-term or to view it as a trade opportunity. If the stock is mainly held by retail traders, this can be a sign that the stock lacks the depth to justify long-term trust from shareholders. And in the case of Matterport, I would say that it's a little bit the case. Typically, the consensus is that there should be at least 25-30% to 30 of institutional participation for the stock to be perceived as a sound investment and not just a short-term trade. This is obviously subject to a lot of exceptions as many great companies can also be held mostly by retail, but that tends to be the exception and not the rule. Let's also take a look at the short interest present in the stock, which is the amount of positions aiming to profit if the share price falls lower. Sometimes when there is significant short interest in the total volume, this can be a sign that there is an organized shorting operation going on, such as what happened with GameStop and AMC. The current short interest is 13% higher than the total float, and 35% of those transactions are coming out of the dark pools. Usually, if the short interest is above 15% of the total volume, and a significant chunk of this coming out of the dark pools, this may suggest that there are institutional positions taken to short the stock, and there would be potential for a short squeeze. In the case of Matterport, I would say that the short interest is definitely there, and it's relatively heavy. However, that's probably caused by organic interest and not like a on purpose institutional position. My recommendation about Matterport is to follow up to the company's stock performance and to be very careful about its price action to see if the upcoming weeks and months is going to prove that the stock may be start reversing. Once that signal is confirmed, then it would be a decent timing to start loading on the stock. I would recommend to commit between 0.5 and 1% of your portfolio. I would also recommend to split the allocation in batches of 20% at a time so that you can purchase more if it retraces. Now, given the current market environment, I believe that the equity market is in a vast phase of correction, especially when it comes to tech and growth type equities. The financial market has been living and breathing thanks to the continuous creation of new capital with different waves of quantitative easings, which will have consequences on the price of assets as well as their yields. With the interest rates kept relatively low over the years and the increase of amount of capital in circulation, this will keep putting significant pressure on the profit that we can expect the investment products across the board. And this, by the way, is a reality that may shift in the years to come if the interest rate of core infrastructures within our globally financialized system increases. It's useful to remember that the market doesn't represent the real economy, and of course, the real economy doesn't always reflect in the stock performance, since the name of the game here is ultimately called supply and demand, which depends on a whole bunch of factors that go way beyond our own control. If we think about it, this is like saying, if your neighborhood house that is put up for sale is only allowing those who actually want to live inside to buy it, Versus if you allow every single type of buyer with different intent or reasons to buy or to sell it. So obviously, there will be a significant difference in the price of this asset for those two scenarios. The market currently works more like the second option. And assuming that it would only reflect the fundamentals of the underlying economy would correspond to the first option. There are a few elements that are considered to be the reasons. The first one is the significant increase of amount of money printed by the central banks around the world, 
which is then distributed to the banks with the expectation that they will be loaned to businesses. Normally, that's a good thing, but with a lack of opportunities in the real economy, the significant portion of that money actually went back to the financial system to buy up the price of existing assets. Now that the QEs have been wrapping up or ended around the world, I think that this drive behind asset price may no longer be as relevant as it is right now for the future. It is now compensated by the arrival of capital from one region to another and from one sector to another even within the same jurisdiction. With the increase of tensions around the world, capital is always looking for a safe haven to park their money into, not just for a place to grow the nominal value, but with a currency that tends to keep its purchasing power as well. The third factor is the creation or the birth of artificial bubbles either maintained by the market trends built up over the years or out of necessity. Capital needs to find a place to stay. Some good examples of this would include the EV sector in the 2020 and the oil and gas securities when there are tensions around the world. Either way, when it comes to the price trends of the market, the degree of uncertainty is a key drive behind the price fluctuations and that is likely going to increase as we go on from there. When company announce that they are going to enter or exit different markets, or that they will be trading on different platforms and exchanges, this can all have significant ramifications on the price of this asset. Some of the considerations to have when operating in this context include having a clear view of what is going on, especially regarding the cash flow and the capital flow, and avoid certain potential pitfalls. One of these is to be careful with short positions. Inherently, short positions are riskier than long positions as the downside of long positions is limited, whereas the short positions can lose you as much money as the stock price may reach, which is infinite. On top of that, we're now seeing a new phenomenon with short squeezes involving a group of retail traders propping the stock price up forcing short sellers to recover their positions. Sometimes the attempt will not succeed, but sometimes they end up in very spectacular success. Something else to consider is to treat tech stocks with care. To start ask questions when the price of a security skyrockets without real fundamentals. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be touching it with a 10-foot pole, but it does mean that there should be a difference between the decision of long-term holding and short-term trading. Either way, a rule of thumb is that each position should be structured in a way so that their individual performances will never affect the portfolio's stability. Thank you for watching. If you like my content, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel.